Once a year, there's a bash. Rolls-Royce owners have... Out at Prince's Dyes' brother's place at Althorpe, Northampton. Something to eat and something to tipple. Owners of the cars, they bring them along, show them off, win a prize, a rosette for the wife, and band themselves comradely together in a club. There'll be a Lou and a Ray, and an Uncle Joe from over there. There's Nigel and Basil, Hans and Peter, and general fat totem of the enthusiasts is Eric Barras, president. We were presented with the fact that we were going to celebrate somehow 90 years of this famous name, Rolls Royce. And our chairman, Brian Wiggins, came up with this fantastic idea that we would hold a round Britain rally. We thought we would drive our motor cars right around Great Britain, visiting all those places which were of particular importance to Rolls Royce and showing the flag, this remarkable flag, wherever we went, to involve as many members and as many motor cars as we could. All over the world there are enthusiasts for particular marks of car, but the Rolls-Royce, for a variety of reasons, has a cadence that is very special, of class and standards that are eternal, but were once thought peculiarly British, of an era, in retrospect, golden. Charles Rolls was the younger man, up from London, based in London, basically a salesman who liked to drive a car. Henry Royce, born of poor people in Peterborough, had after an engineering apprenticeship a factory in Manchester that turned all sorts noted for being fastidious. Rolls-Royce owners have this association with a clubhouse a few miles north of Oxford. It's a shrine and headquarters. It's stuffed with memorabilia and the records of every engine and chassis, every nut and bolt near enough that Rolls-Royce, Bentley, Rolls-Royce Limited and Rolls-Royce cars have ever built. But the rally started not in Oxford, but the other place. Here at Trinity Cambridge, Charles Rolls read an engineering degree. Rolls is portrayed as a bit of a playboy. He was inheritor of a minor title with top draw connections. In 1906, the Honourable Charles Rolls, who had obtained an engineering degree at Cambridge, he was driving one of the very early Rolls Royces in these very streets of Cambridge. And uh, it was therefore thought appropriate that the rally should start here in Cambridge. The club's round trip was to be 21 days, but owners came and went. Only nine completed the full Monty. Some were on for a week or took part for just a couple of legs. And then the tour continued up the flatter part of eastern England. Every day they drove a bit and stopped. Well, every other day, they'd stop for two days off, so local owners and members in the vicinity could join in and purr at one another's Bentley's ghosts and shadows. We have a bid of £28,000 starts at rolling. 28000 is bid, 29000 30, but the 000, annual sale 6, 000, of old roses in Prince's Dye's brother's park, there was a marquee stuff with the living ready to open their purses. So the bids took commission. 42,000, 43,000, 44,000. Here were famous faces, mystery buyers. But remember, remember, the largest ever owner of Rolls Royces was the Scottish Co op for funeral purposes. The largest individual owner, probably the Maharaja of Mysore, who had seven in 1944. 58,000 on my right. Shall These I were the eventually yeah, sold and scattered and then tracked down. This is a historic day. With card 501, a German is putting the Maharaja of Mysore's collection together again. If you're all done, for the last time, 501 at 67,000. Thank you very much indeed. You're very determined there. We just came over in the morning and just only to buy this motor car I was looking for. Many years it would come up for sale 
because I'm collecting specially Maharaja Phantom cars. Um, they always had a very special coach work done. They were sumptuously rich in those days and they could afford only the best and the cars are the best. And this is the last car I was looking for. I now own them all. <laughs> The acquisition of a Rolls has not always come easy. Well, I'd originally um, hired a Rolls Royce to go to a hospital ball and I got rather taken by them. So I thought, well, our life will begin at 50. And when I, just before my 40th birthday, I took out three 10-year uh, life insurance policies to mature just before I was 50, to specifically to buy myself a Rolls Royce. And I went to uh, four different seminars um, run by the club to decide which model I wanted. And I, I came down in, in favour of vintage in Open Dura. The original body was a Mulliner Saloon, and we understand in that form it was used by the Lord Mayor of Manchester as his uh, official car during the Second World War. So it uh, presumably uh, saw active service during the, the Blitz. Leaving yellow bellied Lincolnshire, the process crossed the Humber Bridge. Not in any particular flamboyant convoy. These drivers are individualistic as Dick Turpin. They took whatever route they fancied through the East Riding to the shambles at York and in the gentle Yorkshire wolds above York City, where the chairman of the Enthusiast Club had his ranch. He'd invited members to take a butcher's at his collection, not of Rolls Royce, but Bentleys. Bentley Bentley and Rolls Bentley. Well, we're expecting between 40 and 50. Yeah, I think we must be getting pretty close to 50 now. Whoa, whoa, come forward a bit so they can get out behind you. Brian, the chairman, has been noted for his collection. A specialist among specialists, Brian Wiggins put together these beasts, which Tony Bugatti called the fastest lorries in Europe, the Bentley, because the car was so heavy. It had an exhaust so throaty it was called sexy. Not so much Rolls Bentley, but the Bentley Bentley by William Bentley of Cricklewood, London, prior to 1931, when W.O. Bentley went bankrupt and Rolls's took them over. This is the last one of the 54 litres built. Yeah. Brian has the last one, I have the first one built. Oh, I, I have the company demonstrator. So therefore there is a specific interest in this type of car. I had a crazy idea a few years ago to have one of every model Bentley until they just became badge engineered Rolls Royce. And I started about eight years ago on Bentleys. And about four years ago I had succeeded in achieving that aim of one of every model. And then I decided that they needed a decent building to put them in, so I built this building about four or five years ago. The oldest car is that one over there, which is a 1924 three-litre Bentley. That was the first Bentley model produced. They actually produced the first one uh, in 19, the back end of 1921, didn't really get into production seriously until 1922. And that is a very original car, that one. Brian, because this is a club, has lent his cars to members on occasion. This is a Rolls Bentley 1953, R-Type XSL. The borrower is an American, a vicar, man of the cloth. It does him good to be out for a spin. A wave and he's off the vicar in a Bentley with a lovely backside. Where next? It says. Seat and burn. Seat and burn, Mrs. Hughes. <laughs> and don't spare the horses. Why do you think everybody has been turning left when the instructions say turn right? <laughs> <laughs> Nigel Hughes is another early enthusiast, Goodbye, accompanied for this tour by the wife. Goodbye. Many are. The vintage beasts are driven on, gently Bentley, regal rolls. They've never sold like Mercedes, but always been special up the country, into that county which is England's best kept secret, Northumberland. The classics cross the humpback bridge over brackish burns and past legendary castles. But what's going on here? Familiar territory for a Rolls of any mark. 
Only the white ribbon's missing. My car is a 1936 uh, 2530, which is the the model that was produced by Rolls-Royce and then handed over to the coach builders, who in this case were H.J. Mulliner, who have produced a body which is called a Sedanka de Ville, and that means that the front half of the roof goes back. Uh, so you can sit in convertible splendor in the front and whilst the passengers are cocooned in the back in, in the warmth. So um, it's quite an adaptable motor car. I've had it for four years. Um, I retired from working overseas all my life just four and a half years ago, and the first thing I did was start looking for a Rolls Royce so that I could enjoy my retirement. Everything on that car is so well done and so simple that uh, it makes it quite unique, and uh, I think that is what we all really enjoy when we uh, find something that's so well made. The advantage of being a club is solidarity. If something does go wrong with fastidiously crafted machines and needs fine-tuning, there will be a man who can, a fellow fastidiously particular owner in the club. All know what spanner fits where exactly. We seem to have lost um, spark on the, on the left-hand mag. The car's got two magnetos, and uh, one's not working now, so it's running only on one magneto. That's always the pleasure of going on rallies with people who uh, are interested. One can't carry every tool, so um, we hope that whatever I don't have, somebody else has got, or whatever knowledge I don't have, uh, somebody else might have, and we'll um, try and find out from the technical facts um, some of the answers try and get the magneto running for tomorrow. Henry Royce never, never used an adjustable spanner. Anathema. Wouldn't tolerate a spanner unless Henry designed it exactly to fit the knot. Whenever the tour halted, there was a member with the knowledge. Engineering and class, you bet. Ambrose's orchestra knew. Their man had arrived with his Bentley. This one six and a half litre engine with Vanden Plas body. This classic log to Jack Buchanan classic star of silver screen said something on Sunset Boulevard, eight litre engine. That's class. It came back to Britain, was owned by a Dutchman who lives in London. Restored in the late 80s by the late Jeff Huckle, a well-known restorer and we only acquired it recently. It had been a car I wanted to have for a long time, but the man didn't want to sell it really. And in the end, I persuaded him to part with it. A little scotch mist wet the glass of next day's morn. How traditional. Well, that's the part of the fun of it. We like the open top, and we never put the top up unless it's absolutely essential. We hope we don't have to put it up at all uh, the whole three-week tour. I think they're the finest car in the world. Also, Pauline's late father used to own a fleet of 23 of them. Mind you, not for pleasure. They were for, uh, workhorses, but um, this one is purely for pleasure. A Phantom II, 1929. Oh, she'll cruise all day, right, around about the 60 to 70 miles an hour. It's not the easiest of cars to... Uh, handle, especially in high winds. It does tend to blow you about a bit, but uh, well, you just battle against that and keep going. O'er the Firth of Forth, beyond Stirling, the sun came up, glistening the silver salmon scotch water to make the enthusiast feel very good. Man and this legendary machine. Peregrination progress to arrive in Perthshire as honoured guests of the Scottish branch of the club at the Dune Motor Museum.
They had a little lecture. The rich and not so rich from Mr. Wardlaw, a fellow member. It's all very period. Agatha Christie period. There'll be scones for tea. And his widow subsequently advertised it in the autocar. We are fortunate here to have the sole surviving three-cylinder car, sole survivor of six, which Royce built in Cook Street, Manchester. As a member of the Rolls-Royce Enthusiast Club, I, I, I consider myself to be privileged in being associated with this car. I was a very close friend of its owner, Adam McGregor Dick, and before he died, he made a deed of gift to the Royal Scottish Automobile Club in order that the car would remain in Scotland. Very quiet running, isn't she? <laughs> What do I think of it? It's surprisingly small. The uh, the view over the bonnet is unbelievable. You can you can definitely see where the front wheels are going, can't you? And uh, the windscreen's very low, so obviously it gives no protection at all in the weather, which is a good reason for not needing windscreen wipers. Nigel Hughes, a wit, whatever the weather. And wherever they park, their hobby is going to be admired. It's a 1907 Silver Ghost. Chassis number 577, the fourth oldest silver ghost in the world. And the chassis and engine are original. It's, a, it's the second body, the wagonette body. The original body was a Barker, but the previous owner didn't like the body, so he changed it with a Renault, because the Renault didn't have the power, but he liked this body. So he threw the Barker body away and put this Worsley body on. Well, I drive it probably three weeks every year and the rest of the time it's at the Alford Grampian Transport Museum. It isn't expensive to run as long as you look after it. It has to be well oiled, well greased, well maintained. The tyre pressures have got to be very accurate at 50 pounds. And it has different sized tyres front and rear. The top speed is 65, but uh, the brakes aren't too good. It only has rear brakes and the transmission brakes, so you have to be very careful um, on twisty rows that you don't go too fast because of the difficulty of stopping. The Bentley section are powerful. This Rolls Bentley is Derby built, still complete with original number plate. It was used at a motor show, then sold in 1935 to a Mr Arthur Haas, AHP. The inside has been made to my design. Uh, when I bought the car, it was a derelict car. And it didn't matter because I wanted to build up a car to my very own taste design, technical standards, and uh, also the interior has been made here in England according to a door design which is called the Rising Sun and uh, has been well made by a very good craftsman. It's three and a half litre drop head coupe, body by James Young of Bromley in Kent and owned today by an engineer Hans Benz Brandt, who think in metric. I'm a German of the German section and I have a secondary residence in England in order to run that car with the old number plate because if I would run the car in Germany I would lose the number plate. So this is how far you can go with enthusiasm. <laughs> there we are, pedals down. As every coachwork is individual on a Rolls, customised, before the word was invented. So the route each owner took on the tour was theirs. Some took the high road, others the low. What was in common was the enormous affection for the traditions of this most individually crafted of cars. And to polish that, all would have a chamois in the back. We had trouble with the wipers. When we went to Italy, we had to take the windscreen off because she was too high to go on the Italian railway. And when we put the windscreen back on again, unfortunately, with one of the screws, it went through the, through the wire. So we had a small fire in the uh, fuse box three days ago, but not to worry, everything's OK. They were all sorts, the members. Not by any means all born with silver spoon in the mouth. Some were not rich at all. We love it. Enjoy it every minute. We make the whole tour. Silver Spirit, 88. Uh, I had it new. It was imported in 
89 to Switzerland. Uh, I was in England 49 to 51 for three years. And the uh, people I stayed with, they had all sources and Bentleys, and so I was very fond of them from there. But I had to get as old as I am now so I could buy one. <laughs> the well-tailored Swiss were represented. The well-heeled Michael Caine, not on this rally. There were members who were very provincial, blunt as Henry Royce himself. Here is Mr Buckley in a cardigan with his Silver Spirit 1982. If you buy a car in reasonable good condition, with a bit of edge about it, then you're not paying a fantastic amount of money that's going to depreciate over the, over the years, providing that you've got a, another car to, to run around in. And this is what I do. What does Mr Buckley run around in? The roses purred through Kirkston Bass. Some a little throatily, but no running around. In the Lake District, it was gliding. Some of them have been here before. The cars, driven on training rallies, tested for the continental Alps in our lakes. It was one of the most wonderful experiences of my life that I found out then the potential of this car. It was found in 1962 in a barn as a hearse. And it went to Restore of Derby, who unfortunately are no longer now. But they did a number of these cars, uh, the early Phantoms, in very similar models. This youth, here adjusting the roof of the old convertible, wearing a Hovis boy hat, is Greg. The lad's a junior member of the club. Rolls-Royce enthusiasts overseas, over here on his holidays with his uncle Joe, who owns the convertible. The family are from Atlanta. In making the decision to do the rally uh, around Britain, uh, the car had to come over. Uh, it came over in a 20-foot container aboard ship, landed at Thamesport in the London area, and. Uh, carried to a warehouse where I picked it up, learned how to drive in downtown London uh, for the first time in my life uh, on the left-hand side of the road and drove to Northampton, and that's the story of getting it to, to England. His Phantom was built in England, though Rolls-Royce did for a time in the 1920s manufacture cars in the United States at Springfield, Massachusetts. But Uncle Joe's Phantom is Derby-built, Derby, England. One of the things that uh, stimulated the interest on this particular car were some of the more unusual features that the original owner uh, required. One of them was uh, a bar with five beautiful uh, crystal uh, decanters. And there were other uh, devices and instruments in the rear compartment of the car. A speedometer for uh, a millard, a, uh, a altimeter, the original owner's selection of a car and, and my selection of a car uh, ran in parallel because uh, it, uh, we like the same things, uh, apparently. The motor cars, there'd be 50 traveling every day in different combinations, snaked together on a rare occasion nose to tail through Lancashire's trough of Boland coming down by Barnoldswick, where Rolls in the 1940s took over Rover's jet factory. Soon these witch-infested hills reverberated to the roar of testing Royce's aeroplane engines. This is a, a Silver Shadow, uh, one of the last of the first series, so some people call it Shadow One, and um, I've had it since 1991. When I first bought the car, I thought, it's rather big, because, I mean, compared with a normal car, 
it is big, and I thought, well, this is going to be very difficult to drive, particularly on country lanes. And in fact, the opposite is true. In my own profession, I was an aircraft engineer. Uh, it goes without saying that Rolls Royce were the best there, and I've worked on Rolls Royce engines all my life. And in my, uh, I was, I flew aeroplanes ultimately, and I flew on 747s with Rolls Royce engines. So it was for me, it was just a natural thing to go for the Rolls Royce, the finest car in the world. A doctor's coupe, car by Mr. Rolls and Mr. Royce, noted in the carriage trade of its day to be the only car a doctor could arrive and leave without disturbing the patient. This car has always been in, in excellent condition. 1921 Silver Ghost. At, at the period, it, it was quite fashionable for doctors to have a, a two-seater car, and consequently, they got, therefore, you get doctor's coupe. Kirkston Pass, we did that stop at the top, which a lot of people did anyway, and we found we needed um, to, to alter the fan belt, which is a whittle belt, which is a leather, early type leather belt. And we altered it, we took one link out, because the belt at that time was too slack, and so the fan wasn't sending the air through the radiator as it should have done. She, she goes very well anyway, she, she copes with it very nicely, and it's a nice tight car, and it's, it's It'll do it it'll do it very easily, so there's no problem. You've just got to go, take it to the steady, steady to it, and it's OK. Mr Rolls had met Mr Royce here in Manchester at the Midland Hotel for lunch. It was a simple meeting, Rolls and Royce, in 1904. Here they agreed a partnership to make and sell the best engine and chassis there could ever be. When they came to Manchester and the Midland Hotel, the enthusiasts clapped each other. They clapped the name, they clapped their hobby, they clapped the class and then the engineering. But they had to call outside for someone to bake them a cake. The enthusiasts did a lap of honour in the city for Mancunians. They rolled out here in formation, led ceremonially by AX201. Built, chassis and engine, in Royce's premises at Cook Street, Manchester, on the south side of the city near today's Moss Side. Rolls, of course, never spent time in Manchester. The Honourable Charles was in London, busy showing off the work to his class chums. It was important. They persuaded early on the HM of his alma mater, Eaton, to try one of these. In Bray Cottage, Henry Royce lived well enough, not in Manchester, but on a knob hill of Cheshire. He'd made money engineering lifts and overhead cranes. His Nutsford home was no cottage. He'd arc lamps installed so he could work at night, if necessary, outside. Every amenity except, you can't believe this. He didn't believe in garages. There's never been a garage here at all, as far as I understand it. And I don't use garages, so that was the reason that I bought the house, I think. <laughs> Royce moved eventually south to sort of semi-retire in Sussex and the south of France. The firm were in Derby, and then the car division moved to Crewe, where it stayed. It's still manufacturing to the original ideal of trying to be not the fittest, but the best. No enthusiast can visit Cheshire and not call at the existing works. This whole tour was tailored to hit this spot, Crewe, on open day. John McGlynn. For most of the members of the club, this is like a trip to Mecca. <laughs> this is where it's all at. This is the centre of the world. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people have never been here before, and I can see that they're absolutely thrilled to bits. Royce was forever taking things to bits, all the time a tinkering. He used what had been known later in the century as Japanese methods. Get hold of a rival's machine, take it apart, examine what makes it go, and then try and make every bit better himself. There's no better way to do it. For lunch, the veterans took to the hills, as Henry Royce would have done himself, up the peaks and pushing it for cheese and pickle at the cat and fiddle, and a warm pint of Robinson's Ale, just one for the road. It's not Sweden. The uh, cat and the fiddle pub here played a, quite a strong part in the early Rolls Royce history, in as much as many of the cars were brought up here from the tested on the local hills and. Uh, there were uh, general meetings up here as a centre uh, because of the local terrain and so forth. A lot of them were tested, particularly a hill down there 
uh, where Henry Royce himself used to drive up dragging blocks of concrete amongst other things to test out the cars. By close of day, this caravan hit Derby, where Henry Royce had built the factory that later made aeroplane engines and is a cathedral still of Olympian engineering excellence. Your life, when you fly, can rely on this. Mere motorists look up at this window of stained glass at Nightingale Road. Everyone does. The two were always linked, military and civil. Royce made turbines, power station engines, peace and war, Merlins for the Spitfire and something for Vickers. It was Lawrence of Arabia who said in the desert a rose is worth more than rubies. Henry Royce had mottos stuck on the walls reminding his employees, you're on your honour, not to deflect from standards. Here's an exactly preserved example of standards. The 1912 Silver Ghost. This car was made here, and this, this is the earliest one on the rally at the moment, and uh, it was originally delivered to an A.W. Gilmore in London in 1912. He didn't keep it very long. Um, it was bought by the Earl of Mount Edgecombe in Plymouth in about 1914-15, and he actually owned the car up until 1946 when he died, and then it was bought by George Huddleston from South Africa in the 50s, about 54, and taken to South Africa, and I bought it off him um, all four or five years ago. And so I'm only the fourth owner. We're heading west, rolling over Staffordshire and into the blue and lost remembered hills of Shropshire. Wherever they stopped, locals would bring something, sometimes quite eccentric. It's the Antiques Roadshow. To this field behind the Gaskell Arms Much Wenlock, a jazzy old Shropshire boy brought this rare breed, called Vicky, as if it were a budgerigar. And Rolls-Royce never made minis. Although it sort of looks large, it is still a little 20-horsepower chassis with the uh, three-litre engine. Very few shooting brake bodies, I would suspect, were specified, and this, this body isn't, isn't new, isn't original, rather. Uh, it was put on, I think, during the war for obvious utilitarian practical reasons, and um, we bought the car in '57. the body had been on then for some time, and uh, we, we found it useful. In fact, I think it's fair to say that I bought the car in those days because I couldn't afford the luxury of a, of a car just for fun because the car had got carrying capacity. I used to take the local jazz band round, uh, all, all eight of us to different gigs, and we could get everyone in and a few instruments as well. So the car had to work for its living because I couldn't afford to keep it otherwise. It's as simple as that, really. Where are we now? I suppose we're somewhere up in the middle of nowhere or above Landrinod Wells. <laughs> the steering on, on, on this 20 horsepower is absolutely incredible. Very lightweight and no problem at all. Um, my only difficulty is that, of course, uh, being a very early 20 horsepower, 1922, um, it uh, has only got three gears and a bit underpowered. And so we just have to take it steadily. A wooden bridge, a babbling brook, a dry day in Wales, and Nigel's immaculate ghost. I'd call it a duck egg blue. Well, the rally gives us a great opportunity to drive our cars through beautiful scenery, to get together with other enthusiasts, compare notes with them, see how well their cars go by comparison with ours. Sometimes we exchange cars with one another, drive, drive one another's cars to see how that works out. And I had a lovely opportunity the other day. We were driving uh, down from Scotland over the moors. There were about five cars, I think, and uh, all from the rally, nobody else. Um, there was a ghost in front, and I was driving my ghost behind, and we were absolutely matched for speed uh, right the way across. You know, it all felt absolutely right. That was great. To achieve greatness wasn't easy. 
A Rolls you can buy, but owning demands deserves individuality from the owner. In this club, members make an effort. Everyone appreciates when some battered antiques turn up, knowing because it's a Rolls, the work and money you put in will appreciate. It took a period of five years to restore it, um, right from through the mechanics, right through to the bodywork. Um, it's been reupholstered. Um, all the engine um, we've restored and uh, got into tip-top condition. And uh, it's, it's hopefully a very reliable car these days. Of course you need, because they're heavy engines, both hands on the wheel. Your partner can hold the map. I do the navigating. <laughs> And when John doesn't interfere with the instructions, I, um, we normally get there. <laughs> you arrive looking a mess, either by having to wear a flying helmet, um, fashion bit goes out of the window with open air driving. But it's great fun, it's lovely. You, you, you can sort of see things that no one else can see. Um, you can see over the hedges, and you're generally going at a speed where you do actually see things instead of them just flashing past. And um, when you're sitting in the traffic lights next to a Range Rover, you can be awfully smug because you can look over his roof. <laughs> the classic Rolls was of that period, the first motoring, of course, so was Henry Ford. But coincidentally with Rolls-Royce was a golden age looking back of sterling worth and sovereign value, when pints here were in imperial measures and the world was bound in feet and inches. Every seam straight, every bat to the ball, every wit dry, every nut in line. And on this rally, now in mid Wales, every member appreciates he owns one of a rare list, a special breed of car that chances are will never see a scrapyard. 80% of rolls he's ever made are still on the road. It's a Phantom 3, um, it's very powerful, um, and uh, really and truly, out of 700 originally made of the chassis only, I think there's still a list of 600 still around in the world. So really and truly, it's something to hold on to if you can, or enjoy if you've got it. There's no way you need change gear, uh, unless you stop, and uh, unless it's very, very extraordinary circumstances, you can drive everywhere in top gear. This 12-cylinder engine was, of course, developed at Derby, prior to the war. The technical data and that was um, passed on to the development of the Spitfire Merlin. They always look on this motor, this engine, as what you might say, the Mini Merlin. The Mini Merlin? Charles Rolls died in an aeroplane accident. He was born here, his family seat rich enough not to have to do anything. He was gentry from the little then county town of Monmouth, Monmouthshire, where life babbles on as if nothing had changed. Lovely weather, and the sun shone on the first Seven Bridge, with three quarters round and Bristol bound for the West Country. The party took the Clifton Bridge over the Avon Gorge. Bridges and engines, engineering of excellence. And in our era, Rolls-Royce bought over Bristol Sidley and made in Bristol the Olympus, the Paz Concord. Graham Adams and Mrs. Graham Adams did this whole trip of 2,400 miles in a 1919 tour. I bought the car in 1959 from a lady down in uh, near Helston in Cornwall, and her father gave it to her. We didn't use it a great deal until about the last 10 years, and uh, we've used it a lot 
since then. We've done quite a lot of work on the engine and the mechanical side of it, but basically it's a very original car, and as we see it today, is how it was, or how it had evolved for the original owner. This motor, Bentley Continental JD12, built 1957, previous owner the comedian Eric Sykes, went to auction, sold to John Donner, a man of the city who found it not easy peasy to get. And with a lot of bidding on it, and in the end, and inevitably, there were two of us left. One, the best known dealer in Continental Bentleys, and uh, Donner. And we fought it out. And when I'd gone past what I'd marked it, significantly past, I thought, well, I'm going to have one more go. And it was the happiest moment of my life when I saw the competition. It was a very dear person, shake his head. No, he said, I'm going no further. And down it went, and back to Somerset it went. Somerset is where John Donner lives, promiscuously, for John has another car of the mark, this lovely lady he inherited. Well, the story of this car is a piece of Rolls-Royce history. It belonged to my grandfather, and uh, we still have the correspondence between him and Mr. Barker, who designed the coachwork. And uh, under the paragraph accommodation in his letter, it said, chauffeur plus one, guns in rear, brackets, occasional use of the grandchildren. And it actually went out of the family for one year on the death of my grandmother, uh, and then I found it in 1959, after one year out of the family, and I paid £150 for it. And I was told by all those who knew that I'd paid far too much because it was only worth £100. Uh, you may wonder what the devil, uh, the uh, spirit of ecstasy is doing on the front. And uh, I heard people many times come up to my grandfather and say, uh, what on earth are you doing with that mascot on the front, Frank? That's um, a Bentley, it isn't a Rolls-Royce. He would reply, I'm buggered if I'm going to be seen driving around in the product of a bankrupt motor manufacturer. This is a Rolls-Royce. And so he had a silver 20-horsepower mascot of the spirit made for him, and it's flown it ever since. On Saunton Sands in Devon, the order of the day for the club is spit and polish. Against the sea air, you have to. The owner of this landerlet is Ken. It's a 1926, 20 horsepower, Barker landerlet. And it was first owned by Mrs. Stafford, who owned the Hyde Park Hotel in Knightsbridge in London. She was the first owner in 1926. The car was actually manufactured in 1925. Ken drives his landerlet off early to get a bit of a head start. Well, now that we know which way we're going down the motorway, uh, we're going through Barnstable, Tiverton, up towards Taunton, then across to Hindon and Wilton, uh, round Salisbury, and then down towards Southampton, where we will terminate the day's activities, hopefully. Over the military plains of Wiltshire, the antiques made for a modest house in West Wittering, West Sussex, where the whole parish should turn out, way beyond Salisbury, to welcome the workaholic old man Henry Royce's work back home. May this plaque be a constant reminder of him to the people of this village and all who come to this place of pilgrimage for engineers around the world. This is to commemorate the fact that this was his garage and workshop in, from 1917 to 1933, and we managed to obtain his 1921 experimental rolls, which you can see is parked in the garage, returned home after 70 years. He had a garage in his house down here. Not a very big one, is it? but Henry's experimental car, 4G11, was to whiz him to Derby and down to France. He used to drive up to the south of France, which is a trip one day I hope to redo again, but, um, you know, obviously that's got to be a prepared trip these days. I'm always surprised with people 
they don't know my name, but they always say, oh, you're the one that's got 4G11, isn't it? <laughs> and I always face at that, so you're not known by your name in the Rolls Royce Club. Henry's own motor car, brought back by club member Morris just for the day. Some parishioners still remember actually working for the band, else he can as if it were yesterday. We used to have a day off every month when we was in France, and we had the use of the Rolls Royce. The chauffeur used to drive us eight for the day. That was nice. We had the use of the car too long. That was the nearest uh, town then, as you might say, because we were out in the country, you see. They're supposed to have had a rest, you know, when he was out there. He was supposed to be on holiday, but he was working. He had cars coming out there from Derby, and he was always working. <laughs> It was fitting that turnaround Britain got to proud Pompey, on the hard at Portsmouth, parking in front of HMS Victory, Nelson's battleship and the Mary Rose. For Rawls is of this century, but that era, when Britain's thought itself best put to the test. Rawls gave off a certain aura, class, nobby, yes, but built up to a standard. Oh, fantastic, they are something great that Britain still manages to produce, which nobody else can quite make. It's one of those things that you've an ambition to ride in a Rolls Royce all your life, but it's not until you snuff it you get the chance and the undertakes your way. The cars are very long-lived and uh, they do attract people. They're attractive artefacts in their own right. So we give a little bit back when we, when we park our cars somewhere. Uh, and it's delightful to see the interest that, is, that people express in them. I, I get more pleasure out of taking them to bits than I do actually out of driving them. Um, but I can say that about race cars, but this one particularly, it's just beautifully built. I look upon myself as a sort of temporary custodian of the motor car. I, I have a duty and an obligation to maintain it and look after it. Certainly it'll last a lot longer than I will. I think there's something about owning an old car. Uh, it just so happens that these are amongst the best. <laughs> From my childhood, I, uh, I looked at these cars and, uh, well, that was it. It's the ultimate dream, I think. So now, I suppose it's immortal. The symbol, this statue on the bonnet of the spirit of ecstasy stands for something that will live forevermore, for snob reasons in the engineering, for the history and on the long view now, for hard nose, value for money reasons. For the curtain call, it was in front of the fountains at Blenheim Palace. Nine Rolls Royces completed the full rally. But at the final bash, everyone who could turned up, members. They gave a toast to honour the car, and to honour their honouring of more than just a car, a spirit that's for all peoples to admire, that strove not to be flash or biggest or fastest, but simply, with all the try and try again, to make it the best. Round Britain, 90 years of Rolls-Royce, was a highly successful event. I'm sure we did uh, wave the flag. I'm sure we did impress many people with the fact that still to this very day, there is probably no product, whether it be in the air or on the ground, comparable to the works and philosophy of that great man, Henry Royce. Mm -hmm.